After um, all that horrible Shabbos with Mishpachat Fogel a few years back, so this nigga came down a few nights later. I think we've sung it a few times, so sing with me, okay? Shmoy 
Thank you so much for joining us. Going right back into the Kodesh Kodeshim of the new, the new reading of the, another reading of the Torah. Um, before anything, just want to again make sure we're we're, we're continuing the learning. The um, Louis Nishmas Yitzchak Ben Yitzchak Ben Ben Yoshua. Shama should have an eternal aliyah and nachat from his children and grandchildren. Shama, um, oh, her husband, yeah. Oh, he did? Baruch Dan Amos. should be the Luyin Ishmato. And it should be the shortest shiv in the world because Tchais and Mason will come and wipe it out. And also tonight. Yitzchak Leib Ben Zelig. Bezrat Hashem. And, and please mention the names, whoever needs before Shlema, please mention it uh, to yourselves. I feel like um, even though we learned a Sayyid Me Tshuva, the right, last time we learned was a Sayyid Me Tshuva, I think, it was before, before Yom Kippur, right? So it's pretty weird because I feel that really now is this new, now is the new year. Um, I don't know why, Sukkis to me was like Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. Sukkot was everything. It was like, there was so many, I guess, in Eretz Yisrael, I don't understand, like, Sukkot not in Eretz Yisrael. I'm I don't understand it. But Sukkot here, we all know, like, especially with, with the Smachot Beit HaShoeva, you get to see so many people. This year, I mean, we just saw so many people, and I have to tell you about one of the events, because one of them was stuck inside in such a deep and profound way, that's really been Melave, been, been escorting us since it took place, and it's very, very deep in my heart, and I had to share it with you, because it has to tie into everything we're going to be learning tonight, Bezrat Hashem. And it has to do with a phone call that I really had 15 minutes before the shiur, like 20, 25 minutes ago. So this is it. This is, uh, I, first of all, the Moshav this year was beautiful. I felt like the Moshav fair with Mama, she was so sweet. And so many of you were there, and I don't know, that it felt just so homey. It, gets, it keeps on feeling more and more homey. It was so special this year. But right before we were in the Moshav, and I said this there, we were in Hebron. And the night before we were in Hebron, we were on our way to perform in Shalavim, when as soon as we got to the building of the yeshiva, and Eli parked the car, Avi was sitting in the back seat, our friend Avi Hirschberg checked the phone, Boom. It said someone was injured out, right outside Marat HaMachpela. We know, oh my God, in 12 hours we have to be, we're getting picked up to go there, to go perform in Hebron. And of course, we go through the whole evening of, 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 of the Simchat Beit HaShoeva performance. And the second you get off stage, as high as it was, obviously each of us are checking our phones, and it says, Chayal, 20-year-old boy <coughs> killed. Now this Chayal's face, I don't know if any of you saw this Chayal's face, Tmimut, like so tamim, he looked like he when he is twenty is not exactly old, but he's such a precious, beautiful, beautiful kid. And there was an image that we couldn't get out of our minds. And the next morning, 
we had to go to, we, we, went, we got picked up. I thought that some of the musicians in the band might decline, and I was totally cool with that. You can't put any, you can't put any, pull any trips on anyone that feels not safe. That's, you know, the Gemara, the Chazal tell us, when it comes to safety, obviously everyone has to take care of themselves the way they feel. They need to, take, they need, they need to be taken care of. Everyone showed up. The place itself, usually we, we dive in, in a sukkah that's packed with hundreds of people, and it wasn't exactly hundreds of people, and you could feel it in the air that it was very, very intense. Very intense. And when we performed, we were the first because I get there early in the morning to do halal with the chevra, and then so by the time that and then there's all these things going on, so later in the day with, with the moshav, and, and at night we were in Beit Shemesh, so we go first, and then right after we left, we, we, we perform, we leave, and we, drove, we drive back on a road that's usually packed bumper to bumper with cars and buses from Yerushalayim to Hebron, people going to Hebron. And this year, it wasn't packed at all bumper to bumper going to Hebron. But the people that were there, there was, there was still hundreds, there were still thousands of people. It was as if there were like 500,000 people instead of the normal 30,000, 40,000 people in, by, outside of Marat HaMachpelah. Because whoever was there was like a whole million of people, literally. And whoever davened with us was, yes, you were there, right? But whoever davened with us, they felt like Sukkah was shaking because each person was Mamash a whole million, a few million. Scott, you were there too. And it keeps on going. We keep on going. Where, again, the question of what keeps our battery going, what keeps us ticking, it just doesn't stop. And this happened in one of the highest circuses in the world with two precious chayalim who were mamish taken up to, 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 to Mala. And life is going so fast. Who even, who even remembers that? It was already, what is it, two weeks ago? A week. A week ago. It was a week ago. It's Monday today, right? This was a week ago. I can't believe it. And how much has happened since then? So I was thinking about this. And I'll just tell you one more thing and then I'll tie it into what we're tonight, Bezor Hashem. I had to Skype conversation with the chassan while we were singing at his chuppah this Thursday and I had to just go over this the chuppah with him, trying to reach each other with the Yom Tovim was impossible. I finally caught, we caught each other on Skype last night. And um, I saw that as he's Skyping, he's a real Freilich guy, really, like a beautiful, long beard, long pears, and just smiling like, ah, whatever you want to play is fine, that kind of a chassan, and we love those, you know, instead of the, at 125 in the song, switch to, you know, modulate to B minor, those are the, you know. So he didn't say a word, he didn't say a word. So I'm, let's give out, and then suddenly, these little kids start giggling and making smiling faces behind him on the Skype scene. And it was so cute. And I'm like, wow, everyone is like his, his nephews or his nieces. They're so excited for, the, for, for their cousins or their uncle's wedding. And then he says to me, ah, ma, the, my daughter is making smiley faces to you. So, and there was a son there too. I was like, ah, oh, okay, you know, Hashem, second marriage, base reishis, you know, two, second beginnings, reishis, what do we know? And then tonight, uh, the Kala called me to go over some stuff. And she said to me, did you see anything funny on, on the Skype? Did you, did you? I said, well, the truth is, I didn't, you know, I could, I could tell it's not a first wedding. I don't think it's a first wedding. I mean, there are kids there. I assume it's not the first, first wedding. So she says to me, I, I, let me just tell you before, you know. She says, my future, my Chatan, he was married, and she says, Baruch Hashem, he married someone amazing. And four years ago, on Sukkot, a family was in a, a, a car accident. The, three, the kids were fine, and the wife went into a coma for four years, and she died, I, I, I think she said, either half a year ago or a year ago. So, this, I want you to know, this chasen, looked so disconnected from being in control, if that makes any sense. You know, the highest moments we have in life are the, are the ones where we realize it's so good not to be in control. And then we say to ourselves, why don't we just, why do we ever think that we're in control? We're never in control of anything. 
Why do we ever think that? Why do we always have to have these zetzes to remind us that we're not in control? What makes this guy tick? I, 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 can't, I can't begin to imagine. Ma Kesha. Okay, what's, what's going on? So, I saw something absolutely mind-blowing for Reb Shlomo. You know, Rashi is the highest. Rashi is mamish the highest. Remember, we were learning this so many times that the first, you know, this, this past Shabbos, Rashi, so you learn the first Rashi and you learn the last Rashi because you do Vezat Bracha, Simcha Torah, and you learn Breshit. Let's learn the first and last Rashi for a second. We're going to tie it all together. The whole Torah Kula. The first Rashi in the Torah says, Amar Rabbi Yitzchak. And the whole famous question of, why didn't the Torah start with the first mitzvah of Achparsha the Chodesh, Achodesh Hazel Achem, the first mitzvah that Am Yisrael was given? Rather, it starts with the story of creation of the world. And the fall famous Rashi, so the nations of the world won't come and say, whatever. I once saw, in, not a Sifte Chachamim, an Ikar Sifte Chachamim, a beautiful, I think I shared it with you a few years ago, a beautiful parish on Rashi, an, an explanation of Rashi, that says, we checked through the whole, all the Midrashim, all of Chazal, and we can't find any Rav Yitzchak that says this Torah, about that Rashi quoted him, Rav Yitzchak. So what, is, what did they come to the conclusion? That Rashi chose to open up his perush on the whole Torah, by giving cover to his Abba, quoting his father, right? Rav Shlomo Yitzchaki. His father was named was Yitzchak. And he heard a Geval Torah from his father, and that's how he decides to start this whole parish on the Torah by fulfilling mitzvah of kibud <coughs> of honoring your father, which I thought was absolutely sweet, beautiful, highest, <coughs> deepest, everything, every whatever you want to add to that sentence. That's how Rashi starts, by giving cover to his Abba, quoting his Abba. Otherwise, well, we shall give cover to our fathers, Vizat Hashem, proper cover. Last Rashi of the Torah is the weirdest Rashi in the world. You think Rashi's finishing his parish in the Torah, it's going to be something so de- sweet, just like deep and sweet. It's the deepest, but at first glance, it's not exactly the sweetest. What's the first Rashi in the Torah? Last Rashi in the Torah? The Torah says, with the Yad HaChazaka, everything Moshe Rabbeinu did, le'ene kol Yisrael, in front of all of Am Yisrael. And what does Rashi bring over there? What did Moshe Rabbeinu, what was the one thing Moshe Rabbeinu Ramesh did in front of all of Am Yisrael? Is that he broke the Luchos. And then Rashi quotes Midrash that said, God says to Moshe Rabbeinu, Yeshar koach sheshibarta. Shekoyach, that you broke the tablets. That's the last parshi. Boom. Vreshis barelukim sashmayim vesaretz. Are you kidding me? That's how you're leaving us? End of the Torah? Yeshar koach, that you broke the Luchos that came from Shemaim? So Reb Shlomo said something so beautiful. Do you know why Reb Shlomo said to Moshe Rabbeinu, Yeshar Koach Sheshibarta? Do you know why God said to Moshe Rabbeinu, you did good by breaking the Luchos in front of all of Am Yisrael? Because of the next word that happens right after Le'ene Kol Yisrael. What's the next word? How do we begin the Torah again? Bereshis Bara Lukim, Sashmai Vesanetz. And Bereshis comes from the word Bet Reshit, a second beginning. I don't know why we live in a world where we think that we were brought down here, everything was perfect till we messed things up. But God's initial plan was that everything was perfect. And we've just been messing it up over and over again. God, the blueprint of this world, of the Torah, is what? That you break the luchos, but the question is, how long do you stay down? The next word we read is bereshis, bet reshit, second beginning. That's the next word you read right after Moshe Rabbeinu. It says that he broke the luchos in front of Am Yisrael. And here is a very important Torah from Rabbi Nachman that Reb Shlomo used to sing. The truth is, David used to sing this Torah about the three things a person has to learn in this world. I don't do I wouldn't, even if I tried to do it with the guitar right now, I wouldn't do it any justice, but... 
Essentially, there's three things this is based on Rabbi Nachman that a person has to learn how to do in this world. A person has to learn how to walk. You have to learn how to walk in this world. But then he says something very interesting. A person has to learn how to fall. There's a whole limo, there's a whole learning in, in how you fall. Some people, when they fall, they're like, I'm just going to fall flat on my... No, no. There's a whole learning in how a person falls in this world. But then the third thing a person is learn how to get up. Here, Shlomo was very big on, it's okay. You, I mean, it's not okay. You did an Avera and no one can say it's okay. It's against God's word. But that has to do with last second. What does it have to do with right now? Nothing. Your Avera that you might have done, that you fell a second ago, has nothing to do with right now. Because Le'ene Kol Yisrael, in front of all of Am Yisrael, Moshe Rebbeinu, you broke the Luchas. Exactly. What's the next word, the Yiddelach read? Not just on Parsha Bereshit, but on Simchat Torah. We start reading Bereshit. It's the first year I realized, I, I think I understood, why do we read Parsha Bereshit on Simchat Torah? Why don't we just wait for Parsha Bereshit? Because you can't stay down for more than one second. The Torah finishes, the Moshe Rebbeinu broke the Luchas. You can't stay down for one more than one second. Boom, <coughs> Right away. Because yesterday doesn't exist anymore and tomorrow isn't here yet. And all you have right now is the choice of whether you're lifting your head up or not. That's all we're left with in this world. Now, and then now, and then now, and every second. This is all we have, which explains what we're made out of. Such a small nation that keeps on suffering such blows, it doesn't make any sense to keep on lifting up our heads. There's no, it doesn't make any sense. But we know the Torah that, okay, we, we, we're getting patch after patch after patch. How fast do you get up? It depends on how you fell, which really depends on how you were walking in the first place. <laughs> so this is, we're starting to walk together. You know, it says in Lubavitch, they were very big after some Chastorah. <laughs> They would say that the phrase, V'yakov halach ladarko, that now, after we packed our bag with Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur, Sayyasim Yitshuva, Sukkis, Rosh Hashanah Rabbah, which is the highest, Rosh Hashanah Rabbah, Shmin Yatzer, Simchas Torah, is all in the backpack, packing your bags, how do you start walking? V'yakov halach ladarko, this is how each of us are beginning to walk the year. So, alavai, that each of us should have a year of, I hate when people say, it should be a year where no one ever, ever has uh, any fall, any, you know, no, no one ever falls and no one fails in anything, only perfection. None of, I'm telling you, if we, if we experience that for more than like three days, we'd lose our minds. We'd lose our minds. The mamish lose our minds. It should be a year of these three lessons for Rabbi Nachman, how we do it, how we walk, how we fall, and how fast we get up. <coughs> and this, this is mamish le'ene kol Yisrael. And just remember what the Gemara says, Luchos veshivrei luchos munachim ba'aron. Both the broken tablets and the full tablets are both, were both kept in the Ark, in the Aron Kodesh. When we traveled through the desert, you think that once the tablets were broken, we just left it in, you know, the place called Mount Sinai, and then we just kept on walking until we had, or we just waited until Moshe Rabbeinu came down again for another set that was complete. The Gemara says, what are you talking about? Every pain you go through in your life, every falling, every trial and tribulation, that's also kept in the Aram. That's also kept in God's Aram Kodesh. So, don't throw away anything besides the guilt of what well, I'm supposed to be feeling something. That's garbage. That you could chuck ready right now. You're not supposed to feel anything. You're just supposed to feel nothing. The last letter is Lamed, and the first letter is Bet. Rav Shlomo says that the only way to really get up again is through your leg by using your heart. Give us a bracha, Dov Be'er, to use our hearts with every word of Torah we hear. So we have, I have much more, but I wanted to, I don't have, I don't have many, but these, the Sefer we put out a few years ago, which the second volume will be coming out, it should be in three weeks, in time for the next set of Parashiyot, so the, the parish we put out of Reb Shlomo on the Chumash, and I have a few left here for, I, for sale. Alavai, trust me, I wish I could just give these out to everybody. I didn't pay for the printing, so I, I have to collect money for, for selling these. And we have a few left here, and we're doing a piece from it inside tonight. 
Pashat Noach. And it has to do with everything we said until now. One of the most miraculous things in the world when you look at the story of creation is that there's one thing that you're not really sure when it was created. What's the one thing we're not exactly sure when it was created? Water. Water. Because it says that God divided the waters, but it never says, et It doesn't say that God created water. And the Kabbalists speak about this, that water is the one thing that's kind of before creation and after creation. It's the one thing that kind of existed even before anything else existed, and then it takes on a new meaning after the whole existence of the whole world. Mine. There is a piece in Evan Shlomo on this, which we're not going to do right now, but we're going to be doing a different piece right now. Um, just explain it, really explaining, I think, continuing the theme of what we began of how in the world any of us ever have koach uh, to really believe that we're not completely dead. How, how do we think, wh- where does it come from that you and I actually get up in the morning and think that, wh- where does this come? Forget about getting up in the morning. Some people by 11 a.m. have to be reminded that they're still alive, right? It's different, everything is, everything is relevant. But where does it come from? Water plays a, a very crucial role over here. So if you could pass all these out. And if you happen to have a safer here, and if there aren't enough, we'll pass around some of the books that we have here. So, if you have a safer, Avram, I see you have, it's page 89. Web Yeshiva Chavra, I stink. I forgot to email the printout to Ezra before the shear. You'll have to just listen with your, with your ears this time and not with your eyes. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm so sorry. But I'll email, I'll email it to, you all, to all of you afterwards. Bezrat Hashem. All right. Did it reach the back? Is there enough in the back? It's working. Okay. Got to you, Zelda? No? Uh, Itamar? Josh? Oh, oh, <laughs> Alright. Rip Shlomo says like this I want you to know. Why, by the way, I always point out, you know, in Breslov, whenever Rabbi Nachman says, whenever he starts, the highest teachings in Likutei Moran start with the word Da, which means no. And in Breslov, they explain, whenever the Rebbe said that, Rabbi Nachman is connecting to Olam Ha'atzilut when he speaks, and he says the word Da. He is connecting to the highest place in the world. What other Rebbe ever started his teachings saying, friends, ever go to a shir and the rabbi said, I, would, I want you to know. Well, no, you just start talking because you think that she is about just giving over information, showing that you know a lot of Torah. But here you have someone that starts and saying, I want you to know. It's not stam. It's not just like a nice figure of speech. He said he really wanted us to know. Da. To me, this is like the da in, in, his, in his Torah. I want you to know. Why is it that you can drown in water? You should never ever have to see this. But why is it that you, well, it's possible to drown in water? Open your hearts like mad. Water does not address itself to your consciousness. Water is from beyond creation. Boaz, <laughs> If anyone knows, there's certain words here, sometimes I realize it's, we're completely confused with languages, Baruch Hashem. Not so much in Efrat. Everyone knows the second language of Efrat is? Hebrew, Hebrew right? <laughs> what? I'm, just, I'm from L.A. The second language in L.A. is? Yeah. English. Water does not address itself to your consciousness. 
Water is from beyond creation, meaning, like we said before, it's the one thing that was kind of here before the rest of the world was created. Water is basically unconscious. Water wipes out your consciousness. He's speaking here metaphorically, but he's actually speaking also. Tachlis, it can drown, you can be drowned in water. Water has this power to wipe out your consciousness. Why? Why is that? When I'm very sad and consciously, I have no way to be happy. So I put some water on my face and I'm suddenly happy and awake because water mamish reaches the unconscious. Have you ever tried this? Whenever you're really in a bad place and you just sit there and you, put, and you take some water you put on your face, you could keep on trying to fight the fact that nothing really has changed in your life, but everything on a subconscious level begins, begins to change. Water has that effect on people. Do you know why we always wash our hands with water? Consciously, my hands think that they did everything. But you know what I need to do? I have to reach the unconsciousness of my hands. Right? Kochi ve'otsem yadi. We always think kochi ve'otsem, the power of my hands, is what built these houses, and it's what wrote these books, or it's played these instruments. The hands are the most connected to consciousness. And yet I keep on, I always, in, in Yiddishkeit, what is it always? Rechitzat yadayim, I keep on washing my hands. Why do I have to keep on washing my hands all the time? It's on the radical washing my hands. It's not stam that, listen, before you daven or before you eat bread, it, no, before you daven and you think, look how gewalt you're going to be, Disconnect yourself from kochi ve'otsem yadi. Before you eat for food that you worked for or grew, disconnect yourself from, look what I brought to the table, and realize it's, it's coming from a much higher place. But you know, in, in Hasidut and in Kabbalah, you know what this terminology is called? <coughs> I just saw it. Itamar, we just saw it in Reb Tzadok, Kabbalah Om Machut Shemaim. It's called Siluk Negiot which means the removal of your own negia, which means, how do you say ne negia badavar? Your own involvement. interest, involvement. involvement. Yeah, your own, your own what to do with it. Nachon. Siluk negia. It's not talking about shomer negia. It's not siluk negia, right? I wash my hands and suddenly I realize, Givat, it's all a gift from God. It's crazy. You worked for something and you got paid for it. You got the money and you bought the bread. But you realize that it's deeper than all this. Okay, everybody knows that at one point in our lives, every person is driven out from paradise. By the way, you know what's so funny about this line? Everybody knows that at one point they are driven out of paradise in their life, but they think that it's only happening to them. It's true. I like half of the sentence really does stim. Like it, it sits well. It's true. Every person knows that at a certain point in our lifetimes, <coughs> en malasot, in this world you have to go through hell. I don't know why. It's just the way it is. No one. It's not our choice. It's just the way. If you look around this room, do you think anyone in this room hasn't gone through hell in their life once? The thing is, is that what's <coughs> incredibly and powerful is while you're going through hell when you realize that you're not the only one that's had to go through this you know I just heard of an amazing shiva call where someone paid a shiva call to a bereaved parent Shalone da should never know these things and only when a bereaved parent came and sat next to another bereaved parent was there any sense of anachama they didn't even say anything like this last Friday was our, our friend, I mentioned in Shul Shabbos, one of my closest childhood friends, Ari Weiss, his 11th Yorzeit. So Reuven and Zahava Gilmore went out to the Moshav, to, to Ranana. Ish Kodesh's parents went out to, the, to Ranana to pay a shiva call by my friend's parents when he lost his life. His parents were sitting shiva. I can't imagine they really said anything. They're not really the big, biggest of talkers. But I know that just them being in the room, sitting with someone else that went through something similar, is the closest thing to what we can say that is called a nechama, to parents who have to bury their child. So can you imagine how lonely Adam and Chava were? 
They were the first parents in the world, and they were bereaved parents. <coughs> and they had nobody to, they could relate to what, what in the world happened with them. You know? It's very powerful stuff, right? First parents in the world that the lost... The first parents in the world were Horim Shkulim. It's crazy. So, just knowing that everyone else in life also goes through hell, it doesn't mean that now you're not in pain, but it just means that the, the pain that you're going through is somehow shared with other people. You don't have to speak about it. You don't have to go through details comparing, oh, you went through that, oh, my story is like this. You don't have to do that. Just sometimes it's enough. You look into somebody's eyes that went through something similar in life that you, that you did, and just being in this world together makes it a little bit less harsh. A little bit less harsh. So again, everybody knows that at one point in our lives, every person is driven out from paradise. At one point in our lives, we mamish go through the flood, a mabul. At one point in our lives, we're fighting against God, and then we're mamish at the end. The beginning of the downfall, see what Reb Shlomo is doing here right now, is he's taking the parsha of Bereshit and Noach and saying, bro, sister, it's not something that happened years ago. Look at your own life. You're also in parshas Bereshit and Noach your whole life. This is what he's doing to us. The beginning of the downfall is that the snake comes to me and says, everything is about consciousness. You have to know what's right and what's wrong. In other words, what's that called in Hebrew? Eitz. Hadat. You have to connect yourself to the tree of knowledge. If you want to make it in this world, we were speaking about this, Shabbos afternoon, the Shia on the Ishbitzer, if you want to make it in this world, the snake comes and tell you, tells you, Make sure your consciousness is mamish anki. Make sure that you'll be able to tell everybody what's right and what's wrong in this world. And only like that you can make it. Consciousness. It's a dot. Friends, it's so much deeper than this. In Gewalt, you have to go through so much pain until you realize that with your consciousness, you don't reach anything. You know, that's the hardest line for any one of us to really swallow and believe in. I'm going to say it again. With your consciousness, you don't reach anything. It's just a build-up to choose to lose it. Like the Ishbitzer says, to take your intellect, your consciousness, all your one and one equals two, and give it to Hashem and say, show me how... One and one always equals one. I know that's a pretty far out statement. We'll get to it another time. What's that? It's far. It's just Yom Kippur, so we have to we're still there. And then you get so crazy until you want to wipe your consciousness out. That's prime. And then you get so crazy until you want to wipe the whole thing out. And this goes to what we said in the beginning. Our buildings in our minds of what makes sense in our lives has never led anyone to any peace in the, of the heart, ever, since creation of man. It's never. The attempt to understand what's going on in this world has never led to any yeshuv adat, to any quiet of the heart, ever. Sometimes people look at these emuna stickers, emuna, it's, everything's emuna, and they laugh, they're like, ah, the easy way out, right? Uh, it's just the easy, that's the cop-out way of dealing with life. And yet you know that the biggest tzaddikim, after all the binyanim they've built in their life of what it means to be real, at the end of the end of the end of the end, they always come back to a sticker like that and say, well, it's, Emunah's everything. Do you think Emunah has to do with the consciousness? Do you think Emunah has to do with the intellect? A person's whole goal is to sharpen his intellect so much till he reaches a place that he says, okay, now that it's so sharpened, here, and give it up to Shemayim. This will get a bit more clear in a few minutes. You know, you know what the people of, next paragraph, you know what the people of the flood wanted? 
they wanted to wipe out the unconsciousness. But forget it, water came and wiped them out. Now let me ask you, friends, on what level was Noah serving God? Noah was serving God consciously. Like, this is so weird that Noah was, in a weird way, he was like the, the strongest resemblance of Eitz Adat in the world, and yet the Torah calls him a tzaddik, which makes it really weird. Why was Noah such an Eitz Adat conscious person? Look at the next line. Because when I see a sinner on a conscious level, they have no way to make it in this world. Sometimes you meet people and you know that on a level of higher consciousness, you can reach them so easily. So easily. But you know what the craziest thing is? People who are serving God consciously, it's so hard to get them to a higher consciousness. If consciously, though, you're nothing, you're mevutal, then it's so easy. There's nothing in the way. Like this is, you know, well, let's, try, let's try to say some very heavy statements right now, if it's okay with everybody, right? <coughs> As if everything else is very easy, right? But understand. You know, the hardest person in the world um, it is to really reach, to, to strive to see that the world is so much bigger than whatever it is? Who do you think? At the risk of sounding very prejudiced right now, who do you think is the hardest person to reach? Who's the hardest type of Jew to mamish reach and infuse them with hit chachut? Everyone's so terrified to say what everyone else is thinking. No, not Haredi. Huh? I'm a Sora Jew. Very good. Not Haredi. What's that? FSB Litvak. Hit it right now. Well, no. You'd be shocked. Even FFB Chassid. Oh, yeah. After this week. Even F. Even I don't know what that meant. Even F of B, Hasidish, even e, F of any B. Uh, I mean. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, but, 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 but all, of, all of the above, but the hardest, you have to understand, like, we're, we're, and, and it comes from a very deep place. Mesorah, the Mesorah Jew, the Jew who has tradition, is the hardest on a certain level to infuse with this feeling of there's something bigger going on in the world than whatever took place yesterday. Do you know why? Because he's in a constant battle to preserve what happened yesterday, to preserve the tradition of Beit Abba, of where he came from. So it's so hard, it's such a difficult struggle. On the one hand, I'm supposed to preserve the Masoret of Beit Abba, where I came from. But on the other hand, Beit Abba wasn't strong enough for Mashiach to come yet because people's hearts are still broken. It's such a, it's such a hard place to be in. Not just because as Yor said it's coming up, but to me Reb Shlomo is the, is the embodiment of the Shiluv of the balance of both sides, of how you have the Masoret of Beit Abba, the tradition of that Yekesha house that he grew up in, those hours and hours and years and years of Torah, yet with the notion of there's something bigger happening in the world right now. But if I just use my consciousness and saying, well, this means that this means that this means that this means a flood is going to come and wipe us all out because we won't know what to do with the water, which represents subconsciousness. And then when you don't know what to do with water, what does water do to you? Mm -hmm. It drowns you. <coughs> when you don't know how to walk, and you don't know how to fall, and then you don't know how to get up, then those high moments in life, instead of them being so beautiful, do you know what they do? Mass confusion then you have no idea what to do with life. I once had a friend who was going through ups and downs, ups and downs. His high moments were so high, his low moments involved him being in jail at times. He said to me, Shlomo, I don't want any highs anymore. I don't want, I don't want, to take away the lows, take away the highs. I don't know how to float. 
I don't know how to float. I barely know how to swim. This is, and, and I want to share with you, this is the most important thing of tonight. Is there ever a lack of or coming down from Shemaim? There's never a lack of light coming down from Shemaim. What is there always a lack of down here? Kalim, we all know this. What's the Kaili that we're talking about here? Learning how to swim. How do you learn how to swim if you take your feet off the ground and you learn how to swim? What do feet on the ground resemble? Consciousness. It's at that. These are very high. Con- these are very, very high concepts. I'm very aware of it. It's not like a simple shiur, but this is how the Torah chooses to have its second parsha in the whole Torah. We didn't choose it. Okay, let's go back inside. That's why Noah was only the Torah tav on Sunday because he was conscious. Ah, meaning that if he was in Avram Avinu's. Avram Avinu was connected to unconsciousness. Nachon. Nice. Sodom was able to happen because it was connected to the unconscious. Well, like Le- Lech Lecha Me'artzach is the ultimate subconscious Yiddish, uh, uh, step in Yiddish, right? leaving Noach, what you know. It, that they were okay, they did sin, so they deserved to die. Okay, fine, you just accept that on a conscious level, and therefore he was only a tzaddik bedorn of top. But not a complete tzaddik. I guess you call them, uh, what Shlomo would call the checklist Jews. <coughs> right, okay, look what he says here now. now. Now we're getting to, to what we spoke about in Chevron and what we're talking about here right now. Building the Holy Land is not something you do consciously. You work day and night. To be a soldier in Israel is not consciously. To die for God is unconscious, super conscious. You ever think about this? Do you think a chayal consciously wakes up in the morning with a clear um, decision? Is today I'm willing to die for God. It's not a conscious thing. You have to give up your consciousness in order to be in that place, because consciously, as human beings, we're not willing to die for anything. You think when Roe Klein, Hashem Yikomdomo, jumps on a grenade, the grenade then he's like, I was told that this is one of the things you do as a Jew to save somebody else's life. I'm going to jump on the grenade and save Yidin. These are not conscious things. These are not conscious measures. Do you think Yidin, after the gas chambers came to Eretz Yisrael, because consciously it made sense, that a bunch of skinny refugees would come and start building a land and the world would just be okay with it? There's nothing is conscious about this land. It's all water. It's all super con- It's all subconscious. Tatmudah. It's all beyond just it's It's Eitz HaChaim. It's the land of life. And we always say this. All of us here that chose to, left, to leave wherever we came from. Whoever left consciously is still kind of wishing he was still, you know, living there. Because the numbers are conscious. Very, you know... Bank accounts are very conscious <laughs> figures in our life, right? So we don't leave and chutz is to move here because consciously it adds up, right? I mean, it's easy for me to say that my parents brought me when I was nine, but I'm sure that it, people that really had to make the decision when they were, you know, so much I'm older. Have a very hard time with this word conscious and consciousness. Usually in my mind, consciousness means like a higher way of seeing something. Oh, nachon. Of, 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 and also of being like, very present, with, like when, whatever happens, you're very present with it. So you're not acting in a, in a random way, or you're not reacting to things. You're acting from a, a place of, of consciousness. Yeah. So I'm very confused with his using this word consciousness. I don't know. What would you substitute it with? I don't know. It almost seems like I would use unconscious instead of conscious or something. I don't know. <laughs> I, I don't know what I would use. You know, conscious. What's that? From the mind and from the heart. Um, well, look, today, honestly, Rastas have kind of hijacked this terminology. <laughs> Rastafarians have hijacked this terminology because uh, there's states of <laughs> there's states of consciousness and awareness. Uh, awareness is a much better word, I would think. That's good for subconsciousness, meaning you're really aware. Consciousness means, you know, he really, he really just means, you have to just think of it as, it's a dot. I don't know what word in English to use. If anyone thinks of a better word, by t- what's that? Logic. 
Uh, yeah. 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 Rational. Yeah, more rational slash logic, maybe. Totally. How do we connect it with the beginning? I want you to know that. <laughs> That's only after Chochmah and Bina. You, you have to, the real dot in this world is, is letting go. Dot is after Chochmah and Bina. Whenever, if you go through Chochmah and Bina, you're connected. Well, now I feel weird saying consciousness, but you're, 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 if you go through the real first stages in life of Chochmah and Bina, then you know that the, everything you see is nothing close to what really is. It's like right now, you look at me, I look at you. Hopefully I know that there's a million more miles of depth than what, I'm, than what my eyes actually see right now when I look at somebody. But that's that, to know that what's in front of me isn't close to what really is in front of me. I won't say I know, I say I think, you know. Maybe the next, I, th I think the next paragraph will actually be very helpful right now. <laughs> there are moments which happen to us when it suddenly hits us that give up. Life is so deep, it's so deep. You know what happens to you when you're standing by the holy wall? You think that... <laughs> <laughs> you think that rationally, you're, logically, you're standing there and for a few minutes you're offering your little prayers? It has nothing to do with time, and it has nothing to do with space. <coughs> and here I want you to know the deepest depths. This is very deep. Look at this. Noah had no tests. God told him something, and he did it. God told him build like God told him build a teva, and he did it. With Avram, there's a new way of serving God. God is testing you. This is something which didn't exist until Avram Avinu. The level of nisyonot in life. You know what testing is? Testing is something which reaches my subconscious and my unconscious. Like, meaning, if I'm able to overcome certain tests in life, the real, real hard ones, it's not because logically or rationally I really worked on myself and I came to a conclusion. Those real big tests in life are connecting to a very, very, very deep place in me, inside of me, that's much deeper than logic. Suddenly I'm coming to a point that unless I am purifying the inside of my inside, I won't be able to go through with it. You know what a test is? Consciously, well, again, this is really good you said that, Bracha. And the truth is, you know what? If you heard his voice saying it, you wouldn't have the question. Everyone knows, we always know this, when we learn these Torahs, it's 50% because hearing his voice saying the words really will solve so many of the questions we have on what he's saying. We're just doing the best we can with him being away for already 19 years. Mm -hmm. Consciously, meaning logically, rationally, there's no way of me going through with it, meaning with whatever the test is that I'm going through in life. But there's something so deep inside which is giving me strength to do it. So on Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur and Sukkot, I'm praying to God. God gives me everything and I share it with the world. And then comes Simchas Torah, the last day, when I realize that's not even enough, whatever I had until now. Master of the world, I want you to give me something where the giving doesn't end. I want you to give me something so deep with which I can revive the whole world. And on that day, what do I do? Mashiva Rach, Morida Geshem. I pray for rain. I pray for this one drop of water to give myself new life, to bring the whole world back to life. You shall draw water with joy. <coughs> you can basically give over conscious teaching. It's hachaim, eh, sorry, it's hadat teachings in the world. But unconscious teachings is like the prophet says, Kamaim layam mechasim. Any of you say this in your nusach of Tashlich? 
This is one of the words we say in Tashlech. Lo yareu velo yashchitu bechol har kochi. That's for Yeshiva Ben, one of my favorite songs. Lo yareu velo yashchitu bechol har kochi. Why? When, when will there be no hashchata in the world? When will there be no lo yareu velo yashchitu? When there'll be no destruction in the world? Kimala haaretz dea et Hashem. That the whole world will be filled with God's knowledge. God's knowledge is Eitz HaChaim knowledge, not Eitz HaDat. Like what is it compared to? Like the water covers the ocean. Kamaim layam mechasim. The water has this power to bring us the closest to the day of Hashem. The water of the ocean is so deep. Do you know why water is always in plural? Like, then how do you say Mayim and Yachid? May? May? No, that's not Yachid. May is plural. May is plural. There's no, there's no singular for water. Why? One drop is hiding the other drop, Rip Shlomo said. Every drop is hiding behind the other drop. If all I am serving God is what you can see, then it's meaningless. If my loving you in this world is only what you can see, then my love is not worthy of you. It has to be so deep and so hidden, like he explained the concept of why water is always in plural and not in yachid. Let's try to make a little bit of... Well, I'd be really stupid if I said... Let's try to make a lot of sense of... of uh, <laughs> let's try to bring this rational you know, down to a rational, logical level. Last week we learned about the Eitz Hadat and the Eitz Achaim, the Tree of Life and the Tree of Knowledge. Now we've learned something in this year for many years already. Every Parsha, not just these Parshas, every Parsha in the Torah, every time Reb Shlomo teaches, he's always bringing us to where? Back to the garden to try to fix the sin of the, of the, Eitz, of the Eitz Hadat, of the Tree of Knowledge. It's like this with every single Parsha. I could only give it over to you in my own, in my own examples in life, and hope it's okay with you. For instance, with music, I'll give you one more example about somebody else. If I'm conscious, well, if I'm like totally conscious, not on the level of being deep conscious, but like that I'm aware of the set list and the songs going on, and each change in harmony and each modulation, and each guitar riff, I might be able to give you a fantastic show. But that I am completely detached from anything deep and real that might be taking place right now. Because it's, that's entertainment. But when I lose myself in a nigun, there's a chance that maybe, 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 I'm connected to that. And that's true about each and any one of us when expressing our neshamas. If I feel safe enough to lose control, not in a, not in a scary, like, what did I say to you last Purim kind of way, you know? Not, not, not like that. Not like that. There's a time for that. There, there, Purim, right? But if Yom Kippur, I'm, and unfortunately I spoke to a lot of people, if I'm sitting in shul, really doing some internal deep calculations whether it's working or not, <laughs> meaning if this is working or not, and I'm doing all of this, and I think it's really deep because God said that I have to, it's a day of v'initim et nafshotechem, if I don't lose myself at a certain point in the davening where I stop wondering if you forgive me or not, God, then I'm not really there. Then high moment, then you know what happens to me? I have high moments in life that I don't know what to do with and I start to drown. Because no one ever taught me how to let go. People teach us very, very good how to hold on. But we're not really taught how to let go in a way that's tsanua, that's um, um, modest, yeah. In a modest and a humble way to let go. Is that, that, does that sound at all? Can anyone relate to that at all? You know, one, I, I've shared this with you one time, one of the most dreadful experiences of ever playing a wedding was when 
I sat with a, a chatan and kala, this is years ago, before their wedding, and I always tell every chatan and kala, <clears throat> after they go through a whole set of the songs they want, and I always say, listen, this is cute and sweet, but you realize that you're not going to be, you're not going to realize any of this anyway, right? Maybe the chopa, but dancing, you're not going to realize any of this. So, one time, I'll never forget this, we were in Binyan Ayoma, and we were playing, and this chatan had his set, his set list down. Every song was mamish set down. The transition, what song to go to what song. I even think, like, what havara to sing it in. Sometimes he wanted it in Ivris, and sometimes he wanted it in Ivrit. He was like really a yeke, such a yeke shechassan. Like everything was down to the wire. Right? But I knew already, obviously, come on, he's getting married, he's going to be, going to be disconnected from all this, who, who cares? And one of the scariest moments of my life is when I saw him dancing, and I said, ah, he doesn't realize, I'm going to go to Nigun that I, I want to go into right now. <laughs> <laughs> and he, he stopped his own little circle and said, <laughs> <laughs> you know what? You know what it is. Our lives, especially here in Eretz Yisrael, they're filled with so many high moments all the time. It's like it's not like it's hard to be spiritual. It's so easy to be spiritual. But you know what the hardest thing in the world is? The hardest thing in the world is to, is, is to let go and swim in it. Instead of swimming, we keep on getting drowned, not in evil thoughts, but in not knowing, what do I, how do I continue to fly on sh after Shabbos? How does it continue after the high? What do I do with it? So some people are so scared, they're like, they dive in so much while things are going so good, don't let, please don't let me go, please don't let me, don't let me let go of this, please don't let me let go of this, but wait a second, you're not even in it. You're out of it. You're not even in what you're talking about right now. You're outside of it. You're not even in it. So HaKadosh Baruch Hu tells us very clearly, there's going to be crazy waters going on in your life. You're going to be thrown out of, Eitz, of, of the Garden of Eden, and there's going to be a mabul in your life. But do you know what Hashem told Noach? Bo ata v'chol beitcha el hateva. And the Baal Shem Tov says so beautifully, what does it mean to come into the ark? In Hebrew, the word ark also means word, tevot. Bo el hateva. The Baal Shem Tov says, when you're davening, don't be outside looking at what you're davening. Bo el hateva. Go, in, go into the word that you're davening. Be inside it. Like I once heard of a crazy, you know, exercise meditation of this is that when you actually in Shmon Asre and you're and you're davening, say a word, and then move forward a little bit. Go into the hevel of what your mouth just said. Mechaya, go into the word Mechaya. I'm telling you, it's it's a absolutely conscious, super conscious, aware, like the highest level of awareness of what you're doing in this world anyway. Yeah, if we really daven just one tefillah, we, we could never leave it. Remember, the Baal Shem Tov was scared to daven sometimes because he didn't know if he could ever come out of what he was going to be davening for because he was fully in the Teva, in it. So Bezrat Hashem, this year with all the mabuls that might be happening in our life, all the floods, so first of all, please know that while you're almost drowning in there, don't, you don't have to look around, but just like, know deep in your heart, everyone, everyone goes through hell in this world. Don't compare your hells, but everyone goes through their own version of hell in this world, especially the generation of before Mashiach. Everyone does. And the question really is, after you broke your own luchos, run to the next word of the Torah, Breshis, Bet Reshit, the second beginning. And I think that... Um, I personally think that uh, it's going to be a really, it will be a really crazy Nabul year, but it's like, 
I think we're really well equipped after such a such a tishrei that it's going to be. It's just going to be. This is this is really going to be the most incredible year in the world. Amen. This is really going to be the most incredible, incredible year. How much longer can it not be incredible, right? It's mummy. It's really will be absolutely fantastic. Is what the show.
Shakwa, everyone for coming. We're gonna be davening live right now.